Once you've chosen an overall sequence preset in Premiere Pro, it's worth taking a look over at the settings tab in this panel to see the details of what's really going on. All these sequence presets do is pre-select these menus and you can go in and change all of them right now. First of all, the editing mode, which is effectively the preset. You can see here we've got a DSLR editing mode and this actually gives us all of the options on one big long list here. We can choose all of the different editing modes we like. Then we've got the time base, which is the number of frames per second, in this case 29.97. We've got the size of the frame, that's how many pixels there are in the picture. And although there are many, many, many different HD formats, effectively we've got HD, we've got standard definition, we've got 2K, 4K, now we're talking about super high definition. But if you look at broadcast television, I suppose it comes down to perhaps four formats, really. You've got the two standard definition formats used for PAL or NTSC video. And then in HD, you've got either 1920 by 1080, which is the what I would call full HD, or you've got 1280 by 720. Both of these are 16 by 9, and both of them would be classified as high definition. However, obviously, 1920 by 1080 pixels is an awful lot more pixels than 1280 by 720, so I know which one I'm going to prefer. Then we've got the pixel aspect ratio, that's the shape of the pixels. And you can see here we've got a few standard options. For most NTSC formats, it's square. If you're working with what's called a thin raster format, take, for example, HD Cam. HD Cam actually shoots 1440 by 1080 pixels. And then you've got interpolation to fill in the blanks and stretch that out to 1920 by 1080. You could, for example, choose here HD Anamorphic 1080, and that's going to give you one and a third pixels, which means that, that that they're one and a third parts wider than they are tall. It's just like a 16 by 9 itself. The dots themselves have a shape. And then we've got fields because most classic televisions would draw the picture in horizontal lines scanning across the screen. And each set of odd or even lines is referred to as a field. It's just the name for it. So you've got even or odd fields, and then you've got sometimes referred to as upper or lower. And in this case, you can see here we've got upper field first or lower field first, or no fields at all. DSLRs, for example, shoot what's called progressive video. And progressive video means there are no fields, it's just a whole picture one frame at a time. If anything, I suppose you would say that film, celluloid film, is a, a form of progressive scan. Remember, when you're creating a new sequence, what you really want is for your sequence to match your original media as much as possible. Even if ultimately you intend to output in a different form, let's say you've shot interlaced video but you want to output progressive video, choose interlaced in this menu to reduce the work for your system and then deinterlace on output to convert it to progressive scan. These upper and lower fields are often referred to as interlaced video because they are interwoven if you like. It's an odd line and then an even line and then an odd line and so on. Strangely enough, the DV format, if you're working with DV, has the fields the wrong way around. So they're lower field first, which you'll find comes up automatically anyway. Then we've got our display format, and we're back to choosing whether we want drop frame or non-drop frame, feet and frames or frames. And you'll notice that this is slightly different to the project settings, because here you've got the option of drop or non-drop frame timecode. What this means is with drop frame timecode, every now and then, one frame on the clock will just not be counted. With non-drop frame timecode, you really are working at 30 frames per second. The reason for the drop frame timecode is to factor in that if you broadcast your video, specifically in that situation, if you broadcast your video, then it'll actually be broadcast very slightly slow. And in order to work out how long your program will be, you need to compensate somehow for that in your timecode measure. And that's what drop frame timecode is for. Coincidentally, you can often tell the difference because drop frame timecode uses semicolons and non-drop frame timecode uses colons. How's that for a subtle distinction for you? In our audio options, we have 
our sample rate. And you can actually go up to 96 kilohertz audio, which is able to record a sample rate. I'm not even sure if bats can hear it. <laughs> Humans can hear a, a young, a child can hear up to around 20,000 hertz. So 44.1 kilohertz, which is CD quality audio, is already 10% above that. Once you hit about 18, 19, 20, you're down to hearing about 18 and a half kilohertz maximum. The higher the frequency, the higher the hertz, the higher the tone. So very low frequencies, we can hear down to maybe 20 hertz approximately. That's your bass notes. High frequencies are your high-pitched noises. Speech is somewhere between about 500 hertz and 3 kilohertz. So 48 kilohertz, which is the professional standard, it'll record half that as a maximum frequency. So it's 24 kilohertz, well beyond human hearing. 96 kilohertz, well, I suppose that's 48 kilohertz of uh, maximum frequency. I think dogs can hear up to about 35 kilohertz. But it, it does give you a slightly cleaner audio. It gives you a lower background noise floor. So audio engineers often like to record at that frequency. But for most professional audio, 48 kilohertz is fine. And here we are again. We've got our audio samples or our milliseconds to choose from in the way that time is displayed for audio. Again, in this case, we're looking at the way time is displayed for audio or time is measured. And up here, we're looking at the way time is measured for our video. Now, further down, you'll notice that some of these options are grayed out. And that's because they're tied into the editing mode that we're in. If you change this to custom, you've got the option to change them. And below this option, we have some specific options to quite advanced options to change the way our previews are calculated and just how much rendering goes into them. But we can leave these as they are for now because they're easy to change later. We can save our own preset if we want, give it a name, give it a description, and that'll be added to the sequence presets list. And we can give this new sequence a name and get started with editing. There's no need for you to create a sequence before you go into Premiere Pro. You can make another sequence later whenever you like. I suppose the main reason this menu comes up is to stop people chasing up for technical support because they don't know where their sequence is. If the menu comes up when you first start up the application, it's um, right there in front of you and you know at least that you've got to look for it. So that's the more detailed settings for creating a new sequence in Premiere Pro CS6.